Welcome to your first vodcast of the year. Um, as I mentioned in class, this is our part of our flipped classroom. And uh, the, the, the good thing about a flipped classroom is that normal stuff that we use in class, like lecture and notes, things that really slow down a class can now be done at home at your own time. So my hope is that you would use this video, uh, take the notes that I've given you, fill in the blanks, pause the video as much as you want to, uh, rewind the video as much as you want to, and as we get closer to the test, you can uh, watch the video because most of the information that we uh, have on the test will come from these notes. If for some reason you don't have the notes from the class, you can go to my Live Binders page, that's livebinders.com, and then just search for American History 1 and then uh, type in a, uh, look for the notebook created by Greg Walker. Again, pause the video as as you need to, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. You can see Chapter 4, Section 4 is all about the, uh, the Reconstruction following the Civil War. And um, our objectives for this, you can see, are compare and contrast three different Reconstruction plans. There was a plan for Lincoln, there was a plan for President Johnson, and then there was a Congressional uh, plan for Reconstruction. We'll look at those three. Explain the Constitutional Amendments. Those are Amendments number 13, 14, and 15. Um, some people call those the Civil Rights Amendments. And then also analyze the effectiveness and the impact of Reconstruction. To help you uh, be able to get things copied down uh, with some decent amount of time, um, my slideshow is set to each each little bulleted point or each major point will come up as I click the mouse button or as I click the space bar. So if you hear a little clicking, that's what it is. It's not your computer. And also, I hope that uh, the information given at brief intervals will help you copy down the information uh, more effectively. So this idea of Reconstruction is all about the period following the, the United States Civil War, probably one of the worst catastrophes in American history that we brought upon ourselves. And um, the war is over, the North is won, and the question now is what do we do? How do we repair uh, our country? How do we repair these wounds? And President Lincoln, his goal was, from the very beginning, his goal was to restore the Union no matter, at no matter what cost. But now that the war is over, we sit on this path of Reconstruction, and uh, how do we bring these two groups back together into a working cohesive body. Um, the uh, Reconstruction you can see lasts from 1865 to 1877. Uh, Lincoln's plan was all about leniency. He wanted to again pardon those people who many people saw as the uh, as the culprits, as the people responsible for this whole civil war. Lincoln wanted to offer a, uh, a full pardon to most of the soldiers um, some of the higher officials, like President uh, Jefferson Davis, the president, Jefferson Davis is the president of the CSA, sorry about that, Bell, um, and uh, he would have him, put him on trial, maybe some high-ranking officers, like maybe General Lee, but for the most part, full pardon, easy, uh, make, it, make it very easy for the South to come back together um, as part of the Union. Uh, Lincoln's plan is called a 10% plan. Um, of the southern states, and I'll show you a map here in just a second of those southern states, but of those southern states, if 10% of the voting population voted to uh, rejoin and be loyal to the Union, then that state could come back in. So here are the states, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. Um, West Virginia actually broke away. I don't know why it's red. It's not a, that's not an accurate map. West Virginia is the reason it created is because it did not want to secede with Virginia. Anyhow, if 10%, let's say Virginia, 10% of the voting population of Virginia um, votes to return to the Union and be loyal to the Union, then the entire state of Virginia got to come back in. Now, there's problems with that plan. Um, if 10, only 10% of the people, there were at least 10% of the people who were loyal to the Union even when Virginia seceded. So that, that could completely skew the results. There may be... Uh, you know, 15, 20,000 people still hating uh, the North uh, for what for what happened in the Civil War, and still wanting to be separate from the North. And so the the, the Congress really did not think that that was harsh enough. And you can see number three, uh, Congress wants harsher um, policies for the South because they wanted. Well, honestly, Congress wanted to punish the South, but because they saw some some problems with that 10% plan. Um, before Lincoln could ever get his plan into action, uh, he was uh, assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. I'm sure you guys know the story behind all that. Uh, we might talk about it in class. If you have any questions on that, that's fine. Just make sure you ask me. But we, we will never know if, if Lincoln's plan worked because he was uh, assassinated before it could be carried out. According to the U.S. Constitution, when a president is not able to perform his or her duties, the next person in line, the vice president, will take over. And since 
Lincoln seemed unable to perform his duties due to his uh, death. Um, Andrew Johnson, Vice President Andrew Johnson, takes over. Johnson was named Vice President during Lincoln's second term, and uh, Lincoln chose Johnson. Johnson is a Southern Democrat from the state of Tennessee. He is not opposed to slavery, and those reasons are the reasons why, or those characteristics are the reason why Lincoln chose Johnson as his vice president to try to show the South that he's willing to work with the South and bring the Union back together amidst this war. Um, Johnson's plan is not as lenient as as um, Lincoln, but it's also not as harsh as Congress, and there's some differences between the two. Johnson wanted to um, forgive some white, some Confederate leaders and, and, and officers like Lincoln, but at the same time, he really, really wanted to punish the, the leaders of the South for this, this war like Congress. So he shares a little bit, but again, by Congress's standard, it's still too lenient. Congress was not willing to take on Lincoln because of his popularity. He's the president that is viewed as ending the war and trying to bring this country back together um, without really picking a side. But with Johnson, Johnson being a southerner, the Republicans in Congress, the radical Republicans in Congress felt like his plan was too weak and so they began passing legislation or laws that would fill in the gaps that they saw in Johnson's plan. They wanted to remedy these weaknesses that they saw. And if you notice the side slide previous, you notice that Johnson favored a government ran by whites, and he was not a fan of the African American. He felt like it was okay to own slaves, um, but but at the same time, he also criticized the large plantation slave owning plantations for this war being carried out so far. So Congress begins to try to remedy or fill in the gaps, as I said, with with Johnson's plan. And here's where Johnson and Congress start to. Uh, to butt heads. The first is the uh, Freedmen's Bureau. It was an agency set up to help the newly freed African Americans, newly freed African Americans in the South. Um, it helped them with uh, an education, finding a job, finding food, you know, ba basically getting on their feet. These people have been slaves their entire life, their entire existence in this world. They've been slaves. They have no idea how to fend for themselves. Everything they needed, everything they were told to do, was told to their, by their master. They were given their food by their owners. They were given their bedding by their owners, um, if you can call it bedding. But um, they, they don't know how to operate on their own. So the Freedmen's Bureau was created under Lincoln. Lincoln liked it. Lincoln approved it. Um, Freedmen's Bureau is, is now it's up for um, extension. You know, should we continue this? Should we continue sending money to this? And because it was successful under Lincoln's term, uh, Congress wanted to do that. And you know, some people believe that they did it just to get a little jab in it at at, at Johnson because he did not like the African Americans at all. Civil Rights Act of 1866 considered giving uh, citizenship and voting rights to African Americans and this obviously was a was a slap in the face to white Southerners because voting rights and citizenship now puts African Americans on an equal plane with white people and that's just completely against everything that they believed in though the white Southerners and Johnson as well. Obviously, Johnson's going to veto both because he's against any kind of laws that will give um, any kind of favor to one group of people, especially African Americans. Um, Congress begins working on their own plans. Once they see that Johnson's starting to butt heads and veto all these congressional acts, um, Congress starts working on their own plan. And Congress has the power to override Johnson's veto, and they do. They extend the life of the Freedmen's Bureau. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 is played out and then Congress pursues that even further to create what's called the 14th Amendment. I need to pause here and talk about the 13th Amendment since the 13, 14, and 15 are the constitutional or reconstruction amendments. We need to talk about that. The 13th Amendment is the amendment passed while Lincoln was still alive that freed African American slaves. 13th Amendment states that uh, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the United States except under conditions of penalty for a crime. So the 13th Amendment gave the, the former slaves their freedom under the Constitution. Now the 14th Amendment here um, allows them, former slaves, to become citizens and uh, it prevented any states from denying those rights and you can see as it's defined there all persons born or naturalized in the United States. Naturalized means it's a, uh, a process in which you go through, you're not born in the country so you have to go through a process mainly it's uh, it's a length of term living in the United States or and or it's uh, a test that you have to take 
and then uh, a pledge, you know, you pledge allegiance to the United States, uh, basically it's you're saying that you're going to be loyal to this country. So when we say the Pledge of Allegiance on Monday mornings, that's what you're saying, that you're going to be loyal to this country. The 14th Amendment nullified the Dred Scott decision, and um, we're going to talk about the Dred Scott decision in class. I don't want to take up time right now on the podcast for that, but that's one item that we will discuss in class. Uh, the Reconstruction Acts of 1867 were passed. Basically, it said that um, all of the southern states are going to be divided up into five military districts. Again, we're talking about the congressional plan. And remember, Congress thought that Lincoln's plan was too lenient. They did not like Johnson's plan, mainly because he's a white southerner, but it was also too lenient. So this Reconstructive Act of 1867 is an extremely harsh, very punitive um, uh, punishment that's uh, on, the, on the South. And basically it said that each military district had to follow the rules of Congress and they had to give African-American men the right to vote. They had to ratify the 14th Amendment. And if those, those two requirements were met, then it would be considered for re-entry into the Union. It wasn't uh, just an instantly re re-entry into the Union. They would be considered. Congress wanted to make this as difficult as possible. Well, if you think about put yourself in a white southern plantation slave owner uh, frame of mind, uh, you don't think African-American men or women are equal to you, so you're not going to give them the right to vote because that makes them equal. You're not going to ratify the 14th Amendment, again, because citizenship makes them as equal as you and gives them the rights of freedom just like you have. So that's not going to happen. Congress knew this. Congress knew that the southern states would not buy into this or not fall into this. And so it was just going to be a period of military control. The northern army was sent down to these these, uh, five different districts, and basically it was martial law for several, several years. The construction or the uh, the congressional plan for reconstruction is is obviously a direct contrast to Lincoln. Um, Again, they weren't weren't willing to take on Lincoln while he was alive head-to-head because they didn't want to challenge that. that popularity that he had, but once he's out of the way, it's basically open door and Johnson's just a, a stepping stone in the way. You can see here letter F, Johnson's impeached. Uh, let's talk briefly about the word impeach. To be to impeach a president or any official simply means to bring charges against. It's not to kick them out, that's removal. So you can go through an impeachment process and then if you are vote to be removed, then you're removed from your office. But impeachment simply means bring charges against. Well, in the case of Johnson, um, they don't like Johnson standing in their way because every time they, the Congress proposes something, Johnson, Johnson uses the presidential veto. Um, so Johnson kind of slips up and gives Congress a reason to remove him or impeach him, excuse me, impeach him from office. Congress had passed a law called the Tenure of Office Act, and basically it said that any position, any person in a position of power, like Secretary of War, that person remains in that position until they choose to leave or until their time is up or they get elected out. They cannot be removed. Tenure means you have to have a really good reason to get rid of you. There are some teachers in our district, myself being one, that have tenure. Um, I've taught for a certain amount of years. After five years, you get tenure. Basically, once you prove that you are able to do the job effectively, then that job's yours until you choose to get rid of it, or until you, until you choose to leave, or until you do something really outrageously stupid, and then you can be fired. Well, the Tenure of Office Act for um, president, not presidential, congressional officers basically said the same thing. The job's theirs until they choose to leave or get elected out or really do something stupid. Well, in Johnson's mind, Secretary of War Edmund Stanton did something that he didn't like, and he saw that as a violation of the Tenure of Office Act, so Johnson tried to remove him. Congress did not see Stanton's actions as a violation of the Tenure Act, and so they tried to bring those charges against Johnson. Here in the next couple slides, we'll look at the specific act that Secretary of War Edwin Stanton carried out that Johnson viewed as a violation of the Tenure of Office. Basically, he did something that he didn't have the power to do, and in in Johnson's mind, that was a violation. So we'll look at that in just a second. But um, Congress votes, the House of Representatives votes to impeach, um, completely impeach, and then it goes to the Senate, and the Senate decides not to impeach by one vote. Johnson is saved by one vote. And the guy who voted that, that one man who voted against impeachment, um, we'll talk about him in class. So make sure we remember, uh, well, let's talk about that rep- that senator in class who voted against impeachment. He was a Republican, too. So we'll bring that up in class again. Not enough time here to talk about it. Johnson's term ends um, with all the stress and everything that he had to go through. He obviously chooses not to reelect or run for reelection. I apologize again for those uh, 
bells. Um, Grant wins mainly on the popularity of his war efforts. He, he was named um, General of the Union Army. And it was him who got General Lee of the South to surrender, and so all that popularity carries him through the election. Even with that popularity, he barely wins. Um, he's just not seen as a very strong candidate, but he's the best popular candidate that Republicans have had to offer. Um, Grant mainly wins because of the vote of the African Americans, and this vote, uh, African Americans in the North and in the, of the South, but. Uh, a lot of African Americans vote in the South, and that's from those states that are trying to follow through with that Reconstruction plan from Congress. Um, under Grant's term, you can see the 15th Amendment is passed. The 15th Amendment is the third amendment of these Reconstruction Amendments or the Civil Rights Amendments. The 15th Amendment gives African Americans the right to vote. <clears throat> There's the official words of the Constitution. Now, many women's rights organizations like the uh, National Women's Suffrage Association, Association excuse me, um, did not agree with the 15th Amendment because they did not believe African American men should be given the right to vote before white women. There were many black women in these white women's suffrage groups. When these white women's suffrage groups stood up against the 15th Amendment, 99% of the black women left the group because they saw that as a uh, slap in the face to them as black women because black women even though the 15th amendment did not give black women the right to vote at least now these women these black women have someone in their family representing them in the in the uh, voting booth and so when white women disagree with the 15th amendment we see a big we see a big split in the uh, white suffrage groups Uh, the conditions of the South after the war, it's really obvious. I mean, General Sherman is <clears throat> very well known for destroying the South. His march to the sea, burning uh, plantations and farmland as he went, is called total war. Um, but their economy is destroyed, their infrastructure, their roads, their buildings, their cities, they're all destroyed. So, you know, Reconstruction is a major undertaking. And that's why it goes on for so long, because they have so much to rebuild. Politics in the post-war South are, are run by various groups. One group, we call them scalawags, not scallywags, not the pirates, arg. Scalawags, these are white Southerners who, during the war, were very much in favor of the Democrats because they were in power. Very much in favor of slavery because that's what the Southern Democrats wanted. Basically, these are people who are looking out for their best interest and they're going to pick the side that appears to be winning. After the war is over, these people become Republicans because Republicans won, Northerners won, Whites won. And if you were to ask them, well, they would say they've always been against slavery. It's like the, the, you know, a friend of, that you might have that at the beginning of the football season, he's, a, he's an ardent Cowboys fan. And at the end of the season, when the Super Bowl is being played and the Niners are in, He's wearing Niner stuff. And if you ask him, he's like, oh, I've always been a Niners fan. Well, that's not the case. So that's that's what a scalawag is during the Civil War. Carpetbaggers, these are northern Republicans who moved to the south um, to basically set up shop. They could be business owners. They could be insurance agents. They could be anybody. But they were not welcome at all because they were seen as people who were willing to take advantage of the south. Maybe they were selling whatever, selling their wares. And in the north, they would sell something for a very low price, but in the south, they would jack up the price really, really high. One, because the item was needed for everyday life, and two, because they could, and there was no way to stop them. So carpetbaggers are not very welcome either. And then obviously African Americans, they were trying to figure out their new way of life in the south. And uh, during this whole reconstruction process, you'll notice none of the notes talk about asking African Americans what they needed. No one ever asks, hey, you guys are newly freed. You guys are now living out here on your own. What can we do to help you? No one asks that question. But yet they're one of the mo biggest population groups in the South. These next couple of slides will go through fairly quickly. Um, as the uh, former slaves, the newly freed men, try to improve their lives, you can see that they, they uh, try to build their own churches, try to build their own schools. Uh, their own community centers, try to find their own way in life because they've never known freedom before. Uh, 40 Acres and a Mule is the action taken by Secretary of War and Edwin Stanton that Johnson viewed as a violation of the Tenure of Office Act. Uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and William Sherman 
organize a meeting with African American leaders in the South. I think it was in South Carolina. And they, they sit down and they ask that question, what can we do to help you? And the African Americans are like, well, all we know is farming. So give us land, give us the tools to farm that land, and then we'll do everything else from there. And that seemed pretty simple because there's a lot of land that's being uh, that was abandoned during the Civil War. When uh, the war was going on, these plantation owners just packed up what they could and left. And they either went to Canada or they went south to the Caribbean or maybe far out west. But now all this land is just vacant. The uh, Northern Army had a lot of mules that they had used to pull all their wagons with. And these mules, they're, they're still okay for farming, but they're not any use to the Army anymore. And so, you know, you put two and two together and you give every African American family a 40-acre uh, plot of land that they can farm. You give them some mules and maybe some uh, farm machinery and let them do their thing. It's a fantastic plan, but Congress voted on it and decided that it was a violation of the Constitution because they did not see that the government has the ability to take a person's private property and give it away. Even though that land was vacated, it's still private property, and so they did not want to violate that or set that precedent. Um, anyhow, that's why Secretary of War Edwin Stanton was uh, was uh, tr tried to be removed by Johnson from his from his position of Secretary of War because. Stanton didn't have the power to do that, didn't have the authority to authorize that. There are other ways in which African Americans can earn a living. Sharecropping is, uh, and tenant farming, sharecropping is where, and this can also be done, you can see by former, or poor white farmers who cannot afford to buy land. Sharecropping, you basically farm a piece of land, you give the majority of your harvest to the owner, you take what you can back to the market and try to sell. Uh, the, the bad thing about that is you have to have the money up front to buy your seed and your, your tools. African Americans didn't have that, so they had to borrow. And you borrowed against your harvest, and you hoped that your harvest would be enough to pay back what you borrowed, but it never was because you had to give the majority of your harvest back to the owner of the land. So then the next year comes around and you are still in debt and you have to borrow more money, so it's a never ending circle of debt. Eventually, when you can't pay your debt, you get arrested, and like the Constitution said, slavery cannot exist except under conditions of punishment for a crime. Well, not paying your bills is a crime. At least it was made a crime in the South, and so former slaves who couldn't pay their bills were, were arrested, and then they were sold to pay off their debt, and then they would be in the hands of the people who paid their debt for them, basically slavery all over again. Um, tenant farming is uh, a way in which you can actually live on the land, and you keep everything that you harvest that's, your, that's yourself you just kind of rent the land from the owner and that's tenant farming is a little bit better but still you're renting land uh, to live on reconstruction goes on for so long and there's so much money involved that it's it's almost impossible to carry out there's so many different opinions even in congress there's so many different opinions and people aren't willing to work with each other and because of that things slow down money gets wasted there's a lot of opposition. It keeps it just continues to drag on, and people get tired of it. So um, in the end, it fails, and we start to see uh, some open opposition in the South. A lot of white Southerners, well, most of the white Southerners were uh, upset over the 13th, 14th, and 15th, especially the 15th Amendment, giving African Americans a right to vote. Um, and so they start to form vigilante groups. Vigilante is a, a, a term meaning to take the law into your own hands. One of the most famous vigilante groups is the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. This word is Greek. Remind me in class, and I'll explain what that word means. I don't want to do it now. Um, KKK. Sorry about that. Uh, and you can see the four goals there. Um, number one, destroy the Republican Party. They saw the Republican Party as the, the main reason for Reconstruction being carried out as long as it has. They see the, uh, the amendments being passed, a direct result of the Republican Party in charge. And so they blame the Republican Party and want to get rid of the Republican Party, especially out in the South, but all over. Um, throughout the Reconstruction government, again, allow the Southern government to run themselves, allow the white Southerner to run the government the way they see fit, help the farmers get back on, on their feet, and then prevent any African American from achieving any kind of equality, basically trying to restore the South the way it was pre-Civil War. Locally, we have a KKK group um, here. They called themselves the Bald Numbers. If you've ever been to Silver Dollar City and read, rode the ride, uh, fire in the hole. That basically tells the story of the bald knobbers, just a brief story, but it tells the story of the bald knobbers. Um, down in Branson, they have a performing group, the, the Theater of the Bald Knobbers, and th that group has nothing to do with the KKK today. They just happen to use that name because it's of a local local history. 
um, and they don't advocate anything that the KKK supports today. In the north, we see Reconstruction falling apart as well. Uh, Grant um, is not really a very good president. I mean, he's okay, but he really doesn't have control of the, of the reins like a president should. There's an economic crisis in 1873, a lot of bank failures across the nation, an economic uh, recession. I don't know if it would be a depression or not, but it would be a, obviously bad economic times. There's a lot of scandals involving, uh, not involving Grant, but during Grant's presidency, actually one did involve his wife, and it was later found out that she was innocent of any, anything that was going on, but because she had invested some of her own money, uh, it, it looked bad on U.S. or United States President uh, Grant. And then the United States Supreme Court, seeing the, uh, the, the shift in the opinion of the American people towards some of these Reconstruction policies, the Supreme Court starts reversing some of its changes that it had made, that some of the radical Republicans had made in Congress. Democrats begin to redeem the South. Um, there's a huge election in 1876 coming up, and basically the Democrats meet with the Republicans behind closed doors. And they tell them, look, you don't stand a very good chance of winning. You might win the election, but your president is not going to be very strong. And if he does win, um, he's not going to be very popular with either Democrats or Republicans. And you basically, Republicans need the, the, the vote of the Democrats to get Hayes elected, Rutherford B. Hayes elected. So behind closed doors, the Republicans agree in order for Hayes to be elected, in order just to keep that power in, in the hands of the Republicans, they agree to abandon the South. And with, with that agreement, the Democrats vote in Hayes. They help vote in Hayes. And the uh, Republicans relinquish control of the South back to the Southerners. And they pull the military out. The military control of the South is over. And what this does for the uh, African Americans is basically enlist them into the next 100 years of uh, racial discrimination that we see and civil rights violations throughout the South that we're all familiar with in history. So that's the end of the notes. I'm, again, pause this as you need to, rewind it as you need to. There are so, several things, two or three things that I said we're going to talk about in class. So make sure you bring those up in class, and if you don't, I will. But uh, let's make sure uh, you get these copied and studied as much as you want to, the, the video. Study your notes, obviously. But um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in class.